hello everyone. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you to the organizers for, for putting together such a diverse um, sort of workshop, and especially to um, Hervé Georgelin, who plucked me from a street corner yesterday evening sort of, while demonstrations were going ahead, uh, while I was standing in a street corner with a suitcase, not knowing where to go. But um, here we are. Um, the following paper um, ponders upon the relationship between a late 19th century Ottoman Armenian manifestation of realism with a capital R, uh, with realism being a dominant intellectual philosophy among um, late Ottoman intellectuals and not just Armenians, but others as well. And nascent moves by intellectuals, including artists, towards the promotion of, as they defined it, um, uh, social reforms, particularly in areas of an array of interlinked problems, again, as perceived by them, um, that had resulted from large scale labor migration from the provinces. And, and all this in the face of increasingly arbitrary and tightening censorial controls during the regime of Abdul Hamid II, that was 1876 to 1908, 1909. But the emphasis is on texts and images um, produced between 1884 to about 1896, 1900. Um, throughout the presentation, um, the reference shall be made mainly to the work of three writers. Do I click this? No, how do I? Sorry. Okay, perfect. You learn something new, something new every day. So throughout the presentation, reference shall be made mainly to the work of three writers, all central figures of the Constantinople um, realist milieu. Um, they are the godfather of Constantinople Armenian realism uh, in Armenian Borsahai Irabash Serund, the influential reformist editor and activist author Arpiar Arpiarian, see him over there, um, his close associate and um, the critic and author Levon Fashalian in, in the center, and the teacher and writer Melkon Gurjian, um, the latter writing under the pseudonym Herant, was a prolific and utmost chronicler of the lives of migrant workers. The presentation shall also introduce several images, specifically oil on canvas paintings in, in a Western mode by three once important, uh, but now mostly forgotten Constantinople artists who were during this period very much part of the realist conversation in the Imperial capital. So, oops, there we are. They are um, the Rome educated prominent late Tanzimat Constantinople artist and decorate, decorator of Imperial palaces, Bedros Sirabian. So over there. Um, one of the first graduates of the Ottoman Imperial Fine Arts School, which was established in 1881 and started uh, accepting um, students in 1883 by Osman Hamdi Bey. Um, he was a much loved teacher, um, Simon Hagopian um, in the center, and the celebrated Naples educated Garabet Shah Mashanyan. By juxtaposing texts and images, uh, I am to demonstrate that the content and artistic impetus driving the production of little known visual documents produced by these artists often differed fundamentally from those of other works from the same period with which they share common realist um, visual vocabulary and, show, and showed in, um, important affinities with texts by the above mentioned reformist writers. I'm referring, referring of course, to the large body of, um, uh, when I talk about the images, I'm talking about the large body of popular and fashionable ethnographic images um, of common street types associated with so-called Orientalist painting produced as souvenirs or aimed for European and other travelers and the local a la franga bourgeoisie. Um, what I'm trying to say is that the Constantinople Armenian realist movement or generation was not an exclusively literary movement as has been hitherto presented, hitherto presented um, by, by, by literature, but it, it also um, involved a very important um, sort of visual aspect. In his important survey, The Modern Light of Western Armenians, Aramadian Hayot's article written whilst in exile in Paris in 1903 and published in the January 1904 volume of the short lived St. Petersburg Russian Armenian journal, Herald of Literature and Art, Pamper Kraganutian of Arvesti, Arpiar Arpiarian recalled the main purpose of the realists to have been the highlighting, and I quote, social problems through literature, end of quote. In Armenian, he explained, and I quote, the expression social problem should not be entirely understood by its European meaning. The Armenian has no influence on the government of the state, for the Armenian press cannot, like that of its European counterparts, 
and its general aims as proposals for its activities. And already for the Muslim, there is no social problem. However, the Armenian race in Turkey also enjoys its own life with its specific social problems. The Armenian forms a separate autonomous body with its own educational privileges, its benevolent institutions, his church, from which emanate all the laws that govern his individual life. The Armenian can internally realize great reforms without encountering any obstacle by the Ottoman government." End of quote. This excerpt provides an insider's view of the Ottoman Armenian millet um, and its institutions. It identifies social problems as being those within the internal sphere of the Armenian millet, where the possibility of action towards their alleviation um, could be taken without any hindrance from the state. These included certain negative implications of urban poverty and large-scale labor migration from the Ottoman East to the imperial capital. In his text, Arpiarian demarcates the social from the political, which he identifies as lying, as I quote, and I quote, outside autonomous Armenian life, end of quote. The latter, he explains, concerned the millet's relations with the state and the Islamic races, uh, and also have a vital importance for the general life of the Armenian race. Um, in the context of Ottoman Armenia and Kurdistan, his reference is primarily to the nomadic Kurdish Asherets tribal groups of that particular region. While these two required solutions, he means the political um, problems, um, the appearance of these problems, and I quote, within the political domain compels writers into caution, so as not to invite the intervention of the state. Arpiarian's observations are especially astute for as the editor of several influential reformist newspapers, especially the very popular Arevelk and its supplement Massis. Massis was um, established in 1852, but by the 1880s, it had basically become a supplement of Arevelk. Um, and um, from 1891, the more outspoken Hyrenic. So we've got the mastheads. Let me go to the... I will, yes, thank you very much. Um, so, um, Arpia Bian would, would, would for more than a decade have to negotiate the increasingly precarious tightrope of Ottoman state censorship. The figurehead around whom from 1884, like-minded intellectuals coalesced into a coherent movement, the above mentioned Constantinople realists. It was under his watchful eye that the newspapers he edited provided the space for the airing and dissemination of progressive reformist views. In their social activism, the, the realists utilized their main weapon, with journalism being um, a cornerstone of 19th century Armenian intellectual life. This was the popular and influential press they controlled. In order to draw attention to these social problems with a view to shaping public opinion and promoting action towards their amelioration. As already mentioned, Chief among these social problem, problems were those associated with labor migration, especially in their uh, provincial Armenian inter, in, incarnation. Of course, labor migration to Constantinople had been a transnational affair with a long history, with the city's migrant population being comprised of every Ottoman ethno-linguistic group from every corner of the empire and beyond. With an economy dependent on the influx of migrant laborers, it had been the opportunity for work that drew these mostly men, generally referred to in Turkish as bekyars or in Armenian as bantuchts. A bekyar basically means single men, even though a lot of these men were actually married. And bantuchts is, is a, has quite sort of tragic connotations in the Armenian language. Someone who's sort of left the home and then basically moved far away from their family, etc. So the move is to mainly the largest city in the empire. A building boom, including the construction of several new imperial palaces, and also the rise of, a new, of new bourgeois districts such as Pera and beyond. The second half of the 19th century was a period during which Constantinople was undergoing rapid physical expansion. The city's unprecedented population growth during the same period was primarily fueled by immigration. Whereas some arrivals settled in Constantinople with their descendants eventually forgetting their provincial ancestries, an important proportion were temporary migrants who often came to the city in chain migrations and whose main purpose was a transfer of remittances to families in the homeland before their eventual return. A major region of outward migration, largely towards the imperial capital, were the Armeno-Kurdish borderlands of the Ottoman East. 
the importance of the increased flow of these migrants, referred to as Hayastansis. Um, Hayastansi in Armenia means someone from Armenia. So that's basically how those migrant workers were, were referred to, um, particularly from the areas to the south and the west of Lake Van, is made evident by the consistently extensive coverage of the theme of migration and associated problems both in the city and the homeland on the pages of Constantinople Armenian newspapers, starting in the 1860s and accelerating from the 1880s to the mid 1890s. So we talk about hundreds, if not thousands of articles, um, sort of dealing with every aspect of, of migration uh, from poverty, unemployment, um, uh, cholera, epidemics, um, and, and of course, um, um, illiteracy and, and education. And for these realist um, intellectuals, education was a panacea, so it was, it was a cure to all problems. Um, by 1890, the editorial, A Practical Suggestion, called Zagan Arachalkma, published on the 5th of May of that year in Arpiarian's Arevelk, was claiming that, and I quote, it is an accepted truth that in comparison with the other peoples of the state of the empire, Armenians have the largest number of Bantuks in Constantinople. By the second half of the century, the very visible and to artists and writers iconic figure of the Hamal supporter, Hamalis in Greek, um, on, the port, on the streets of um, Constantinople had become synonymous with the Banturt, especially from the rural regions around Mush to the west of Lake Van in Ottoman Armenia. Let's try and do this now. Yes, no, yes, perfect. And um, we've got a photograph here. So there's hundreds of photographs I could have chosen. Uh, from, but this is a group of Hamals in the port area of, of Constantinople, um, almost certainly Meshetsis. Um, and um, the map shows the regions from where they actually migrated to uh, Constantinople in that particular period. Many of these men lived in slum-like conditions in Huns, Huns are inns, a dozen or more men from the same village or region cramped into a single airless room in the poorer areas of the city, with a major concentration in port and uh, dock areas such as Galata and Karakoy. Um, they were noted for, for their frugality in their habits and for sending remittances back to their families. The notion of Hayven uh, in Armenian or Hemsherilik in Turkish a particular type of special relation or bonding of people from the same village, town, or region provided a very strong marker of identity for these men, especially when away from their homelands. To many urban Constantinople Armenians of all social strata, these men represented a distinct social group, an undesirable underclass, and a source of embarrassment for the community. The epithets Hamal, Bekyar, or Hayastansi were often interchangeably used as derogatory terms of condescension. The realists um, sought to expose and fight against such widespread prejudice. Recording the dehumanization of the Bantuk Tamal, Arpiaran recount recounted often overhearing church bell ringers, Jamgoch in Armenian, mainly Hayastansis themselves, tell curious inquiries as to whose death was being announced. And I quote, it's nobody, literally not a human being, he's a Bekyar, in Armenian, Marche Bekyar. So these migrants were not human. In his endeavors, Arpiarian conceived a crucial role for intellectuals. He called upon them to go out onto the streets and into the slums of the imperial capital to observe, record, and truthfully represent the rural migrants' life as it is, Gyanka Inchbesquare. He urged them to use close observation to produce a sympathetic image of the much maligned Bantorts, the migrant workers, who formed a major segment of the urban poor, and to aestheticize and idealize the subject's perceived virtues in order to combat such dehumanization and soften prejudice, and thus influence public opinion. So closely observed, the representation of the Bantocht in Constantinople was very much a major preoccupation and dominant feature of much of their literature throughout the 1880s and um, early to mid 1890s. The literary historian Hagok Oshagan, noting the realist's commitment to present Gyanginj Besware, life as it is, confirms that these reformist intellectuals were the first to approach the figure of the Bantocht with utter honesty, something never done in Armenian literature before. The chronicling of the dehumanization of the Bantukt is taken to an unparalleled level in the 20 odd letter articles by Gurjian, Melkon Gurjian, published in Massis between 1888 and 1891, and Hyrenik uh, between 1891 and 1892. Um, he used his nom de plume, Harant. Uh, commissioned by Arpiarian, 
Gujian's Chronicles, adopting the format of letters, comprise an impressive body of text representing with sensitivity and empathy the life of the Bekyar in all its facets. Addressed to Arpiarian, these were by extension appeals to the literate urban Constantinople Armenian to recognize and sympathize with the Bantuk from Ottoman Armenia. The literary historian James F. Mekjian singles out Gujian's letter chronicles on the life of provincial migrants as providing the literary realism of the time with an unparalleled authenticity. According to the essayist and literary critic Ashak Chobanyan, Gujian's descriptions feel, this is a quote, Gujian's descriptions feel, portraits think, and in order to paint them, they dip their brushes in tears and blood, end of quote. Whereas his philosophy comes, and I quote, not from books, but from life itself. Unafraid of stirring taboos, Gujian seeks to shock polite Constantinople Armenian society and his bourgeois readership by showing the most unpalatable aspects of the Bantul's life, the abject poverty, squalor, and suffering. In his endeavor to prevent the true life, to present the true life of the Bantu, Gujian resolutely notes, and I quote, I'm not interested in art. Um, only realities and truths will I put down onto paper in their cold nakedness and their blood-stained ribs and ulcers with a language that is rough and covered with rugs that are torn, end of quote. In his first letter, Gujian recalls overhearing the wailing of a distraught Borsetsi mother, it's an Istanbul Armenian mother, who having recently lost her son, had been asking whether there had been a shortage of Bekyars among the thousands in the Huns who could have died in his stead. With his bitter prose, Gujian unsparingly castigates Constantinople Armenians' attitudes of the Bantukt. And I quote, you see my dear Arpiar, the provincial is not a human, let alone an Armenian. He's born out of a rock. Like a weed, he has grown out of a mountain. He has not suckled from a mother's breast. A mother has never sung him a lullaby has not worried over his cradle. He has no parent, no children, no home, no place, end of quote. Everyone in Constantinople thinks like the, this, like, like, like the morning woman, agreed Arpiarian with sadness. In a correspondence style um, article, Letter from Turkey, Namak Turkiyaits, um, published on the 28th of June, 1890, in the influential Tiflis-based Russian Armenian liberal newspaper, Mashag, means cultivator. Arpiarian, writing under the pseudonym Haigag, declared the visual arts as crucial allies of literature in the work of rendering social problems visible. Calling upon artists to emulate the example of Bedra Sarabian, and I quote, who during the early 1880s had produced well-received paintings of higher stances, end of quote, Arpiarian urged Constantinople artists to render the experience of the Bantukt with the brush in much the same way as several realist writers were chronicling with their pen. And I quote, we hope that the artist also represents to us scenes de Salanner, of the life of the Armenian Bantukt of Constantinople, ventures into the Huns, sees the moldy uh, um, sees the moldy beds, uses the term renders in paint the dark rooms and the terrible caravans derives, he uses the term ahavor, in which thousands of Armenians sleep piled up on top of one another and live, end of quote. He then adds, and I quote, literature for its development needs the assistance of the fine arts. Every Armenian writer who is preoccupied with contemporary life, of course, wishes success to Armenian artists, end of quote. Arpiarian's call made perfect sense for an intellectual current, such as realism, that really had the visualization of real life at its core. In the article, Our Literature, Merkraganu Tuna, published in Masis in 1892, Chobanyan explained the realist modus operandi, and I quote, what do the new writers, the dissenters do? They walk in the streets, they look into every nook and corner, they visit the fields, the forests, and the mountains. In society, they observe everything. They note down and study events. Then they return to their rooms and write, having only their notebooks before them, end of quote. One need only replace note and write with sketch and paint to paraphrase Arpiarian's urging of Constantinople artists um, to head to the Huns and represent the Bantuk with honesty. The realists associated with Arpiarian and the newspapers he edited were especially interested in the work of Constantinople artists and encouraging of their work. Whilst the coverage of the so-called fine arts, they call them, they call it Kerarvest, um, was by no means regular or systematic, 
during Arcarian's editorship of Arevelk and Hyrenic and also Massis, references to the visual arts and the successes of artists, largely but not exclusively Ottoman Armenian artists in Constantinople or elsewhere were more numerous and certainly more engaged. Alongside Sarabian, one of the artists often mentioned was Simon Hagopian, whose close ties to the same intellectual milieu were made implicit through the familiarity between him and other intellectuals and the amicable and informal warmth with which visits to his studio uh, were reported in articles such as an Armenian artist, Hay Arvesta Kedma, published on 31st October 1891, and a painting atelier, Nagashu Tiana Notsma, uh, published on the um, 10th of November 1894 in Hyrenik. Another artist whose work is often discussed and, and celebrated in the press is Garabet um, Charles Nishanyan, who had recently returned from Naples. So Arpiarian had cited Sturabian, whom he had described as the artist of real life, Iragan Yankibat Gerahana, as the first among the Constantinople Armenian artists to engage with the subaltern poor and the migrant. Recording a visit to the artist's home atelier, he notes, and I quote, with a few friends, we visited Bedros Sturabian's home. He had just completed the painting Manu Gakhbar. That slight face with its feelings of sadness, those faded eyes, skinny fingers, the rags, and I don't know what noble wind it was that was waving in his entire face, which turned, uh, turned us all towards melancholy. What an odd thing, said one of our friends. If I were to see him, the old man out on the street, I would certainly have passed him by without the slightest care. Whereas by looking at the painting, his eyes as if magnets pull my glance towards him. Art has perfected nature. The talented painter, by pulling the old man's grief eroded heart's strings, soft as strings, has captured within his eyes the most psychological moments. He uses the, the, he uses the term Panagan, and all the emotive storms that have tormented his heart for 70 years, end of quote. Published in Arabel, um in February 1884, then under his editorship, R. P. Arian's text eloquently and sympathetically describes the portrait of an older migrant man, a Meshetzi Bantuk Tamal named Manuk, um, and the profound effect the work had engendered upon him and his companions. Quoting an unnamed urban bourgeois friend, confessing that he would have passed by the unremarkable poor, poor urban, um, a poor migrant on the street without according him a second thought, Arpiayan applauds the artist's brush for having perfected nature, and thus through the direct gaze of an aestheticized Hamal, enabled the portrait to breach the gulf between subject and viewer. To paraphrase uh, Peter Brooks, it had taken an artist to interest the viewer in the beauty of the non-beautiful. Whilst the current whereabouts of Manu Gakhbar or any photographic or print reproduction of the likeness of the work are sadly unknown. And that's the problem with these images, that we don't really know where they are. Most of them are lost, um, probably in private collections, um, because um, sadly, museums in, in, for example, in Turkey or in Armenia don't really collect the works of Ottoman Armenian artists of this period. Um, so we don't really know where the painting is. But luckily, we have access to another painting uh, by the Rome educated Sarabian of a related subject and from the same period. Um, and it's a painting called Armenian Beggar from Van. Uh, the other way around. And here's a painting. So Armenian beggar from Van, um, that had been ex that, had, that had been exhibited to some acclaim two years previously in the prestigious 1882 exhibition of the artists of the Bosphorus in Constantinople, the ABC Club, under the patronage of the British ambassador Lord Dufferin, depicts a standing man attired in pitiable muddy brown rugs with his hands resting upon a stick and pleading eyes gazing imploringly at the viewer. As in Manu Gakhbar, the artist gets closer to his subject and through the portrait incites pity and appeals for empathy towards the disheveled yet dignified beggar. Observing the painter, one could be tempted to imagine that it was this very work that Arpi Arian and his friends were to refer to um, two years hence. The sensorial authorities had clearly not viewed um, this painting, Srabian's beggar, as subversive or as a critique of the Ottoman state, hence permitting its unfettered exhibition, while other works from the exhibition were actually removed from the show. Um, they had rather seen it as a benign ethnographic representation of an ordinary street type, which were very fashionable during the period. Um, 
such ethnographic works, um, which are usually associated with the so-called Orientalist um, sort of school of painting, uh, produced mainly by Western European artists who are basically visiting or living in Constantinople at the period. But also, they were also produced in the city by the um, city's um, uh, mainly non-Muslim artists. And to sort of uh, give you some examples of the kind of painting I'm talking about is, for example, we've got a sort of series of, of street types here. And these are all by sort of Simon Hagopian. And you see, um, you can see all sorts of different characters, um, sort of exotic street characters um, that were really, really sort of fashionable at that particular period. And you see a beggar standing at that sort of end over there. And just to, to, to sort of... Um, suggest how fashionable the figure of the beggar was in that period. We have sort of photographs, for example, by the Abdullah Freres, who sort of produced um, sort of photographic images, then postcards were published, um, and then artists such as Simon Hagopian and also Ashak Fudvajan, who was the first graduate of the Imperial Fine Arts School um, of Constantinople in 1887, sort of produced. And obviously they sort of used the photograph to sort of create these images. So um, we have hundreds and hundreds of these images around. So um, it is clear, however, that the painting that we're talking about, um, Armenian beggar from Van, um, that the painting was not received as such by all who viewed it. Writing under the pseudonym Askasir um, in an article titled Painting Exhibition, Megara Hantes, published on the 28th of May, 1882 in Masis, the prominent educator and, and educator and writer turned reform activist, Minash Chiraz noted, and I quote, the painting, and, and it's a, my quote is a translation of that over there, of the text over there. The painting represents an Armenian beggar from Van with his colorful rags and dark blue headdress, who leaning upon his stick, looks at the viewer with pitiful eyes. The expression of this painting is, ex is extremely tender and heartrending, Huj Sodaruj. The sensitive brush of the author has succeeded in personifying the Bantuktun mass labor emigration and plundering of our provincial brethren. I saw foreigners who were saddened before this sight, and perhaps wasn't it natural that I should weep? I, who is not a connoisseur of the arts, but simply, and he signs off, Askasa, which also means lover of nation, end of quote. These emotional words by Cheraz, an Ottoman army and establishment figure, betray a reading of the portrait different to that of the censor. The reviewer clearly identifies the, pic of the, the figure of the pathetic beggar ascribed by Serbian an explicit provenance of Van, as a stark personification of all the woes of a rural Ottoman Armenia, stagnation, destitution, physical insecurity, plunder, and social disorder, all of which few of the large scale phenomenon of Bantak Tutun. Of course, there's a context here. It's, this is a post, um, the immediate sort of post um, Russo Turkish 1877 78 sort of war sort of situation in the Ottoman East, um, et cetera. And, um, um, also, um, these words show the um, very clearly show the blurriness of the very fine line that separated sort of our, our, our Piarian's conceptualization of the social from the political, and how easily an author or artist can, could find themselves in controversial territory. So, such words could not have been published in the Ottoman press only four or five years um, sort of later. For example, terms like Armenia and Macedonia were completely sort of forbidden. So, sort of, they were sort of banned geographical names. And they completely vanished from the Ottoman press um, um, from around 1890 until about um, 19, 1909 and the second constitutional period. Um, that artists would have ventured to and into the Huns as, ex as exported by Arpiarian and Gurjan is beyond doubt. The Han would have been of interest to artists, even if only to search for types from Ottoman Armenia to sketch. Whilst I have yet to locate images, um, sketches, um, sketches even, that represent the life of the Bantukht within the Han, consider a painting captioned entrance of the Han. Um, by the Constantinople artist Levon Serapurjian. Even though Kukjian's painting does not venture into the Han, it is a rare canvas that provides a glimpse of and leads the eye towards, the, towards its interior. The image depicts the deserted entrance of an unnamed Han, um, one of hundreds dotted around the city. There is a suggestion in the single sort of um, rustic uh, stool of the guard doorman having abandoned his post, perhaps momentarily. Um, while the artist does not reveal what lies or who lives behind the arched doorways, the shadows and mysterious semi-cavernous interior, the warmth um, of Kukjian's shades and the broad um, generous brushstrokes render this an inviting place 
drawing the viewer in. Much has been left ambiguous for the, for the viewer to imagine, determine and wander its, into its corridors um, with, with the mind's eye. Surviving, surviving images um, show that several artists did heed to R. P. Aryan's call um, and followed in Stravian's footsteps um, during, the late, during the later 1880s and throughout the 1890s um, into the Huns. These included Hagopian and Nishanyan, both very much associated with the Constantinople realist milieu um, and who appear to have gone to especially great pains in order to get a closer look at the subaltern from the East. Examples of their work provide clear evidence no, 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 please, yes, no. Evidence that the Bantuft was the subject um, of these artists' gaze. Consider Hagopian's exceptionally skillful rendition of a Hamal from Mush. Um, <laughs> here on that side. Um, uh, and his painting, Beggar Woman from Van. And um, another painting which uh, had become one of his most famous paintings, and that's a painting uh, called Hamal's on the bridge at, at, at Karako. And of course, I can give a separate presentation about every single one of these um, paintings, but obviously we don't have time. Um, however, in its ambition to present a positive view of the higher sun sea, um, the Armenian peasant from, from Ottoman Armenia, unusually situated in Ottoman Armenia, and it's, uh, this is a monumental painting. No painting from the period can rival Nishanyan's provincial Armenian wedding in Mush. It is a painting from 1890. Levon Pashalyan, who along with Arpiarian had no doubt of the painting's truthfulness, despite neither the artist or reviewers having ever set foot in the Ottoman East, uh, confirms in his extensive review of the painting in Arabelk in July 1890 that every likeness depicted upon the canvas is that of a Bantucht, and that the artist had searched for higher stancy types in every corner of the capital. And I quote, in order to accurately execute the true to type character of those provincial faces, to reproduce with perfect truthfulness the expressiveness of all the items of clothing, of all the costumes, of all the wedding items and furniture with a local color, uh, Nishanyan FND has ungrudgingly taken upon himself to suffer all the troubles expected of an artist of conscience, searching every corner of our capital to seek out all the types that could best suit his purpose, defeating these provincials' naturally inborn untrustworthiness and instinctual unwillingness by all means, by convincing and beseeching the provincial pro um, women to come and sit opposite him, to pose for hours to serve as models. And yet the result has amply rewarded all his labors. For the artist, the excessive fatigue and the endured anxieties, the trials of inspiration ex and execution have all paid off. For the work, his creation is there before him, gay and joyful, and already all the artist's toil has been forgotten." End of quote. The above quote, is very, very revealing. Um, for beyond providing much welcome information concerning a realist artist's working practices, and it is of course unsurprising that the selection of models um, for the purpose of sketching would have been based upon Nishanyan's own preconceptions of um, who constituted a suitable high sensitivity type. Um, it exposes deeply held preconceptions and stereotypical beliefs an intra-community orientalization of higher stances among the urban, westernized, and social reformist intellectuals of the Constantinople realist generation. Reading Pashalyan's and Arpiarian's reviews of the wedding, the presence of much that is contradictory and dissonant in their authors' attitudes towards rural provincials becomes abundantly clear. Pashalyan's attribution of the epithet provincial to the wedding and its participants already makes explicit um, the reviewers' and artists' um, vantage point that of urban para from where Ottoman Armenia is perceived as a distant um, per peripheral land, a rural outpost. So finally, I'd like to juxtapose Nishanyan's um, own 1894 self-portrait with this painting of the wedding um, to sort of help bring to the fore the artists and the reviewers, Pashalyan's particular fascination with the otherness of the Hayat Sansi. This otherness is reinforced by the studied and rigid traditionalism of the native dress of the depicted men and women in antithesis to the artist's own relaxed Western attire in the way that he actually chooses to present himself. Considering his representation of a nostalgic idealized view of what a traditional Armenian wedding would resemble, in which he has rendered his subjects membership of a distinct ethno-religious group explicit through costume and religious symbolism, and has resisted any sign of modernity, in contrast to the manner in which he has represented himself, reinforces in stark relief differences of us and them. 
for presenting differences in attire, in attire as indicative of more um, deeply rooted difference, Le Chagnon has constructed a chasm, a chasm between the urban modern bourgeois himself and the, others, and the other intellectuals and the eternal idealized peasant in, in her or his imagined rural provincial homeland. And um, I will sort of uh, skip the conclusion, but I just wanted to show you um, a couple more pictures that uh, even after the 1896, 1894-1896 massacres, and um, while the artist had already sort of left Constantinople and moved to um, the Russian Transcaucasus, he carried on sort of painting images that dealt with the life of, of the Bantucht. And these are sort of two versions of one of his popular images, the reading of the letter. And um, here, just to show that, um, for example, sort of, you know, the figures that he sketched in the Huns around Constantinople, so sort of he uses them sort of repeatedly. So here we have, um, a portrait of, of a Mashetsi, and the same man also appears in the reading of, of the letter. So um, I shall stop here. Um, thank you very much for your help. Thank you. Thank you very much also.